In this video, I'm going to explain what an enthalpy change is, and then I'll go on to explain the definition of every enthalpy change that you will need to know. So, what is an enthalpy change? The simplest way of explaining an enthalpy change is that it's the amount of heat energy released or taken in per mole of substance during some kind of physical or chemical change. The unit for enthalpy change is kilojoules per mole. You will often hear enthalpy changes referred to as standard enthalpy changes. Standard enthalpy changes are enthalpy changes that have been measured under standard conditions. This means a pressure of 1 bar, or 100 kilopascals, at a stated temperature. If you're currently doing A-level chemistry, that temperature will be 298 degrees Kelvin, or 25 degrees Celsius. Even if the temperature changes during the process, for example, during a combustion reaction, this 298 degrees Kelvin indicates the temperature that the reactants start at and the products eventually finish at once everything cools down again. Additionally, when solutions are involved, concentrations must be at 1 mole per decimeter cubed. You may also hear the term standard states. This just means the most stable form in which a substance would exist under standard conditions. For example, H2 gas for hydrogen, O2 gas for oxygen, and H2O liquid for water. Enthalpy changes can be either exothermic or endothermic. If heat energy is given out overall during a change, the temperature of the surroundings increases and the process is described as exothermic. If heat energy is taken in overall during a change, the temperature of the surroundings decreases and the process is described as endothermic. This can often be a bit confusing. I mean, if heat energy is taken in, why is the temperature decreasing? If it helps, imagine that the heat energy that's taken in is being converted into chemical energy that's stored in our chemicals. So the system is effectively losing heat energy overall during an endothermic change. All right, so what causes this change in heat energy? Essentially, breaking bonds requires energy and making bonds gives out energy. This makes sense when we think about it. If you imagine two spheres connected by a stick and you wanted to break that stick, you'd have to exert your own energy to do so. So, you're putting energy in to break a bond. It follows that the complete opposite process of making bonds results in the release of energy. During a chemical reaction, reactant bonds are broken, so energy will initially be taken in. Product bonds are then formed, so energy will then be given out. If less energy is taken in to break bonds than is given out to form bonds, overall energy has been given out, so the reaction is exothermic. This means the enthalpy change will be negative. If more energy is taken in to break bonds than is given out to form bonds, Overall, energy has been taken in, so the reaction is endothermic. This means the enthalpy change will be positive. Pretty much all physical and chemical changes involve some kind of change in heat energy, so there are many different types of enthalpy change. In the next part of the video, I'll explain the main ones. Before we jump into it, the definitions I'll be using for the enthalpy changes are the definitions that are typically used in the UK. Be aware that some enthalpy changes can have slightly different definitions elsewhere, but I'll try to point them out as we go through them. We'll start with the mean bond enthalpy. This is the average enthalpy change that occurs when one mole of gaseous covalent bonds is broken. Since we're breaking the bonds, the enthalpy change will always be positive. Because, remember, breaking bonds requires energy, so it's endothermic. 
it follows that the average enthalpy change that occurs when one mole of gaseous covalent bonds is formed will be the same number, but it will be negative because making bonds releases energy, so it's exothermic. For instance, under standard conditions, the mean bond enthalpy for breaking one mole of gaseous carbon-carbon single bonds is plus 347 kilojoules per mole. But the mean bond enthalpy for forming one mole of gaseous carbon-carbon single bonds is minus 347 kilojoules per mole. It's the same process, just going in opposite directions. When we refer to the breaking of bonds, the mean bond enthalpy is often called the mean bond dissociation enthalpy. The reason that it's always the mean bond enthalpy is that the value is averaged across many different similar molecules. This is because the strength of a certain bond might vary slightly from molecule to molecule since its environment could be slightly different. A larger value for a bond enthalpy indicates a stronger covalent bond. The enthalpy of reaction is the enthalpy change that occurs when equation quantities of reactants react with each other. In other words, when you're given a specific reaction, it's the enthalpy change for that specific reaction. It could be anything. For example, the enthalpy of reaction for when one mole of calcium oxide reacts with two moles of hydrochloric acid is minus 196.8 kilojoules per mole. This particular enthalpy change is negative, so it indicates that the reaction is exothermic. A quick note here. The units are still kilojoules per mole, but this will refer to either per one mole of calcium oxide or per two moles of hydrochloric acid, as we're using equation quantities for the reaction. The enthalpy of reaction for when two moles of calcium oxide reacts with four moles of hydrochloric acid is double the previous value at minus 393.6 kilojoules per mole because twice as many reactant molecules are reacting. So, the enthalpy of reaction is just the enthalpy change for any given reaction. There are some enthalpy changes for specific types of reactions that you will also need to know. The enthalpy of formation is the enthalpy change that occurs when one mole of a compound is formed from its constituent elements in their standard states. The equation showing the formation of water would look like this. Here, one mole of water is being formed from its elements, hydrogen and oxygen, both in their standard states. Remember, the formation enthalpy always involves the formation of one mole of the compound. So, if I had balanced it like this, it would be wrong. The enthalpy of formation can be endothermic or exothermic. This is because bonds are being broken in the constituent elements, which is an endothermic process. New bonds are then formed in the product, which is an exothermic process. So, the balance between bond enthalpies involved in these two processes dictates whether the overall enthalpy change is positive or negative. The enthalpy of combustion is the enthalpy change that occurs when one mole of a substance is burnt completely in oxygen. This equation shows the complete combustion of methane. Notice again that we're combusting a single mole of methane. No more, no less. The enthalpy of combustion is always negative which is what we'd expect because burning things in oxygen is always exothermic, meaning it always releases heat. That's why fire is always hot, no matter what it is that you're burning. The reason for this is that the bond enthalpies for the bonds in carbon dioxide and in water are greater than the bond enthalpies typically found in organic molecules and in O2. This means that more energy will always be released when forming the bonds in the combustion products than is put in to break the bonds in the reactants. So energy will always be given out overall and the process will always be exothermic. The enthalpy of neutralization is the enthalpy change that occurs when one mole of water is formed from a reaction between an acid and an alkali.
This equation shows the enthalpy of neutralization for when hydrochloric acid is neutralized by sodium hydroxide. The enthalpy of neutralization is always negative. This is because an acidic solution already contains H plus ions from the dissociated acid, and an alkaline solution already contains OH minus ions from the dissociated alkali. So no bonds are being broken when the two react. However, H plus ions and OH minus ions do form bonds when they form water. So heat energy will always be released and the process is always exothermic. The first ionization energy is the enthalpy change that occurs when one mole of gaseous atoms each loses one electron to form one mole of gaseous ions, each with a one plus charge. This equation shows the first ionization energy for magnesium. The first ionization energy will always be positive because it requires energy to pull an electron away from an atom, and hence it's endothermic. The second ionization energy is the enthalpy change that occurs when one mole of gaseous ions with a one plus charge each loses one electron to form one mole of gaseous ions, each with a two plus charge. This equation shows the second ionization energy for magnesium. The second ionization energy will always be positive and will be more positive than the first ionization energy because now even more energy is required to pull a negative electron away from an ion that is already positively charged. The first electron affinity is the enthalpy change that occurs when one mole of gaseous atoms each gains an electron to form one mole of gaseous ions, each with a one minus charge. For example, this equation shows the first electron affinity for oxygen. The first electron affinity is usually negative because we're forming an attractive force between the negative electron and the positive nucleus of that atom. The second electron affinity is the enthalpy change that occurs when one mole of gaseous ions with a one minus charge each gains an electron to form one mole of gaseous ions, each with a two minus charge. This equation shows the second electron affinity for oxygen. The second electron affinity is always positive because it requires energy to push a negative electron onto a negative ion, and hence the process is endothermic. The enthalpy of fusion has a bit of a confusing name because it's actually the enthalpy change that occurs when one mole of a solid melts to form a liquid. This equation shows the enthalpy of fusion for water. The enthalpy of fusion is always positive because it requires energy to break the bonds between the solid particles, so the process is endothermic. The enthalpy of vaporization is the enthalpy change that occurs when one mole of a liquid vaporizes to form a gas. This equation shows the enthalpy of vaporization for water. The enthalpy of vaporization is always positive because it requires energy to break the bonds between the liquid particles, so the process is endothermic. The enthalpy of sublimation is the enthalpy change that occurs when one mole of a solid sublimes to form a gas. This is when a solid turns directly into a gas, skipping the liquid phase entirely. This equation shows the enthalpy of sublimation for carbon dioxide. The enthalpy of sublimation is always positive because it requires energy to break the bonds between the solid particles, so the process is endothermic. The enthalpy of transition is the enthalpy change that occurs when one mole of a substance changes its state. The enthalpy of fusion, the enthalpy of vaporization, and the enthalpy of sublimation are all examples of this. The enthalpy of solution is the enthalpy change that occurs when one mole of a solute dissolves in water to give an infinitely dilute solution. This refers to a solution that is so dilute that the addition of more solvents wouldn't change the concentration of the solute. This equation shows the enthalpy of solution for sodium hydroxide. The enthalpy of solution can either be positive or negative. This is because before the solute is dissolved in the water, two things must happen.
the solute bonds must be broken and the water's intermolecular forces must be broken. This all involves breaking bonds, so it's endothermic. Following this, attractive forces are formed between the solute and the water molecules. This will be exothermic. So, the enthalpy of solution depends upon how endothermic the first process is compared to how exothermic the second process is. The enthalpy of hydration, more commonly known as the hydration enthalpy, is the enthalpy change that occurs when one mole of gaseous ions dissolves in water to give an infinitely dilute solution. This equation shows the hydration enthalpy for lithium plus ions. The hydration enthalpy is always negative because it only involves attractive forces being formed between the ions and the water molecules, so the process is exothermic. The enthalpy of atomization is the enthalpy change that occurs when one mole of gaseous atoms is formed from a substance in its standard state. This equation shows the enthalpy of atomization for sodium. This process will always be endothermic because it always involves breaking bonds. This definition is typically used in the UK and will be the only definition you need for A-level chemistry. However, be aware that some people define the enthalpy of atomization as the enthalpy change that occurs when all of the bonds in one mole of a substance are broken to form gaseous atoms. This definition can result in the formation of more than one mole of gaseous atoms, so it's not equivalent to the main definition I gave. It can also be easy to confuse the enthalpy of atomization with the mean bond dissociation enthalpy, since they sound quite similar. However, they describe different processes. Remember, the mean bond dissociation enthalpy is the average enthalpy change that occurs when one mole of gaseous covalent bonds is broken. The mean bond dissociation enthalpy for chlorine is shown in this reaction, where we're breaking one mole of gaseous chlorine-chlorine single bonds to form two moles of gaseous chlorine atoms. The enthalpy change for this process is plus 243 kilojoules per mole. However, the enthalpy of atomization is the enthalpy change that occurs when one mole of gaseous atoms is formed from a substance in its standard state. So, for chlorine, the enthalpy of atomization is shown in this reaction, where we're breaking the bonds in half a mole of chlorine molecules to form one mole of gaseous chlorine atoms. Therefore, the enthalpy change for this process will be half the enthalpy above. On top of this, the enthalpy of atomization can be used to describe things like metals, which don't contain covalent bonds. This reaction shows the atomization of magnesium, when we're forming one mole of gaseous magnesium atoms from magnesium in its standard state, which is a solid. By the way, this just so happens to be the same as the enthalpy of sublimation for magnesium, because it's the exact same process. The lattice formation enthalpy is the enthalpy change that occurs when one mole of a solid ionic lattice is formed from its constituent ions in the gas phase. This equation shows the lattice formation enthalpy for sodium chloride. The lattice formation enthalpy will always be negative because it involves the formation of ionic bonds, so it's exothermic. The opposite of this is the lattice dissociation enthalpy which is the enthalpy change that occurs when one mole of a solid ionic lattice is broken down into its constituent ions in the gas phase. This equation shows the lattice dissociation enthalpy for sodium chloride. The lattice dissociation enthalpy will always be positive because it involves the breaking of ionic bonds, so it's endothermic. The most important thing about enthalpy changes is the wording when it comes to the definitions because they're extremely specific. This comes into play a lot with Hess cycles and Born Harbor cycles. Check out the links in the description to see my videos on the easiest ways to solve these. Please consider subscribing if you enjoyed this video and let me know in the comments if you have any questions.